Well, if this morning was the aperitif and the warm-up, we're now into the meat and, the meat and potatoes, the oil traders. Um, the title of this panel is The Increasing Importance of the Oil Trading Companies. And for this session, as moderator, I'd like to introduce uh, Marcel van Perke, chairman of Atlas Invest, uh, to moderate the panel and introduce his guests. Thank you, uh, Peter. We talk uh, this afternoon uh, about the increasing, and it's almost evening, but uh, <laughs> uh, talk about the, uh, the increasing importance of the oil trading companies. Um, as we all know, it's, it's been a very difficult time, especially for upstream, but the, 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 the trading companies uh, have done well. And so we would like to, to, to talk with, uh, with, with uh, the, the major people behind it, and we'll go more in detail. They're all, all three of them are real entrepreneurs, have built very substantial businesses in this space about the success and why are they successful and what are the risks and what are the opportunities. So we have here uh, Daniel Yegi. Daniel is president and, uh, and, and CEO of the Mercuria Group, based in Geneva, but big global business. Ian Taylor, uh, most of you know Ian, also president and, uh, and CEO of VITOL, probably the, the relatively oldest trading company. I'm not saying old, oldest trading company around. And, um, <laughs> and then Torbjörn, who is also president and CEO of, uh, of Gunvor. And, and Gunvor has, 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 has also gone through a stellar development and, and also very, very big into to assets right now, like, like the others. So um, what we will do, we will talk, uh, we do Q&A with the panel. We do that for roughly half an hour. And um, I have a number of questions. And uh, after that, we'll do Q&A, open it up for, uh, for the room. And the first question is, of course, why, what is the significance of uh, the trading companies being so significant, so, so successful? Is, is it significant? Is it a trend? Is it, is it something which, 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 which maybe is, is, is a sort of you know, an opportunity in a certain time space or are we seeing a much more important trend here? And maybe Ian, because you're, you've, you've been around the, the block for a while. Uh-oh. So <laughs> shine I'm some light. And, and the others, of course, feel free to chip in. You're going you're gonna to hate me, Marcel, but I'm yeah. going to start off by really questioning your... Um, assumption because I mean to a large extent oil traders have good years they have bad years I, I would I, I do genuinely question whether they are consistently successful I mean you take two or three examples that are important I mean one there's not been many more of us for a long long time which tends to suggest in a free capital world it's because I think we'd all agree our margins are so small that nobody else comes into our space and you would remember you know, the number of oil traders that exist today compared to what existed in the, the 70s, okay, not many people were born, only me was born, but the 70s, 80s and 90s is hugely less today. So I think we've just got to be a little bit careful about making that assumption. In fact, I would also make a very important point, that may be the most important point, that it's not just oil traders, you know, the, the majors have extremely successful oil trading parts of their businesses. In fact, maybe in many ways more successful, sadly, than ours because they've got bigger, bigger assets to trade around, bigger positions and, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, my old company, The Great Shell, is about to control the whole LNG space, you know, which is, you know, all credit to them, but it's going to make it, uh, make it very difficult to trade LNG. Um, so, I mean, yes, I think we've learned a huge amount on risk management. Yes, um, you know, we, we are able to, to, to uh, do well in times of, uh, of, of, of disconnect, um, you know, but I think just because last year was relatively good, I mean, I hate to say it, 13 was pretty poor, um, um, you know, 16 is not going to be good as 15. Um, so, I mean, I, I think we, we, we have learned a great deal. We do use systems. We're, we're very, very, um, I think, we, we have great discipline today, um, thanks in some ways to, to the lessons we learned from people like Wall Street. But I, I, I genuinely think that if you look at our rates of return on capital employed, they're okay, but this is not, this is not sadly Google. I wish it was, you know, I mean, you know, but we are not. And if you look at the numbers, you look at the returns, 
we're doing okay, but you know, it's okay. Sorry, come on. Let me let, let me let me let me chime in on that. I'm, actually, I was born in the 1970s, just, yeah. so. but I was trading in the 1970s. <laughs> um, yeah. You're all right. Don't worry. Come get on. The, I, I think that maybe what what you would you know can put your finger on a little bit is is what the the basic function of of the trading companies is try and balance supply demand right to the, you're, you're, we're we're part of the the ecosystem that balance that, that that essentially as as a system always has to rebalance itself and those those that, that rebalancing function in commodity markets in general where somehow the marginal molecule tends to price large parts of the complex. That rebalancing function is vital to the market it, and it always needs to be there. And so somehow what happens is you need to deploy capital to, to essentially be able to perform that rebalancing function. And, and that's sort of, you know, that, that's really what, what, what we're about. And obviously with the kind of swings that we have, in, in markets, um, with the changes, the dynamics that are in markets. I'm thinking, for instance, you know, think about the energy, think about, you know, um, renewable power, think about all of the changes that have happened in the generation landscape over the last, let's say, decade. Um, those rebalancing functions are fundamentally important and um, that's really kind of what we do. And so somehow we're associated to the perpetual change that happens in the world and in our, in our industry. Yeah. Maybe Torbjörn, you want to? Well, I mean, mostly I, I agree with, with what you say. I think that uh, it's important to understand that the trading company does not add oil to the global supply demand balance. What it does it works with various arbitrages. And uh, if you're going to be successful, you have to spot those quick because competition is intense and, and trading houses uh, we now see embedded in, uh, in major oil companies and more is to come. So for us, being independent, non-associated, so we have to work by simply being perhaps better, faster to survive because they are very, very small margins. So we work with various arbitrages, geographical arbitrages, time arbitrages, product versus products and all these things. And, and, and I, I dare to talk a little bit on behalf and we do surprising a little guessing of what the flat price is actually. You may think that that's how we make our money but we, we don't really. We have tried to create these values and then we add some assets which we think that helps us on this way. In our case, refining, terminal, various transportation, logistics, just to try to create that. So, and uh, that's it is. Margins are very, very small. Margins for error is even smaller. And uh, it's true. I think we learned a lot from uh, regulatory authorities and we're taking up those challenges. We all have added compliance uh, department, legal, and, and, and we are aware of that the eyes are on us. I think over the years that the trading companies have been a little bit more corporate than they used to be and we open up um, even Ian has hints about how much money he makes somehow which was completely <laughs> unknown some years ago. So, yeah, yeah. That's a big Thanks Torbjörn, I'll no, remember no, no, that no. one. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, you're right, it's all transparent now, almost. I always almost. get some of these wonderful journalists try and, you know, you know get some, get their, some dreadful banker leaks out. And it's hopeless, hopeless to try and keep <laughs> anything a secret. So th the next question is, is a sort of combined question. It's what makes a successful uh, trading company? And, um, and is there a risk that either being too successful or too big is, makes you less nimble? Is, is it also sort of, so it, it really, is there a trend where you can grow? Is there a recipe for success? And Torben, why don't you kick off? Well, I think that the young What's the formula? Uh, formula Tell us. Is, uh, well, I think that you have to be nimble and big at the same time. 
I think it's very difficult today to create a new trading house from scratch. I think the investment to do that is going to be a long way. And, and, and you have to have a certain size. I think uh, you need to be global. You need to work the long arbitrages and you need to have a certain minimum amount of capital so you can, you can uh, buy. And I think we all have um, lucky living in a world where, where credit is cheap and, and we do enjoy the confidence from financing institutions. So it is not something that you can build overnight. Um, and uh, uh, I think that, as I said also, we all have our own ways of doing that, but some kind of combination by fixed asset and have some income to support or complement to the trading income is important. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think the, the, the point here is an, an important one. I think, you know, we do, I think the other guys are the same to a certain extent, or we all do it slightly differently, but we're, we're very disciplined about separating out how we manage assets from managing the trading businesses. You know, we have to, you know, I think it's a genuine worry that we can, we can all become a bit too corporate and, and therefore, you know, not wishing to quote Liam Fox or anybody dreadful like that, but you know, there's the, the worry about fat and lazy is always there. So, I, I mean, I like, I like the idea, which I think we all do, of making sure that you've really separated out your, your assets, you have them you know, in, a, in a proper box in terms of incentivizing that management to maximize the returns for that business and you keep your training business hopefully as lean and as hungry as you possibly can. Um, and, you know, um, I mean, to a certain extent, we're constantly trying to evaluate all the businesses. We're constantly probably, you know, adjusting where we put the emphasis. You know, occasionally we have to accept we can't make any money in businesses and we have to get out of them. And, um, you know, and, and I think that's, that's inevitable. I think it's part of the reason you've seen us all develop a little bit upstream or downstream because within the trading world, there is simply, there's almost, there is no room when you've got incredibly efficient national oil companies, very efficient, you know, IOCs. I, I think we'd all accept there literally are, you know, there's, there's nobody out there who's asleep. Um, so I, I think it's organizationally, we've had to get a lot, a lot smarter. Um, obviously, people has become a, you know, it's always an incredibly important thing. Um, but I think it's this division of um, accountability, which is a really, key to trying to sustain yourself longer term. Daniel, you want to comment on it? I think three or four things. Access to capital. I think best in class risk management. Best in class compliance. And a market that gives you an opportunity. Some markets give you better opportunities than others at different times. There are more, there, there is a bigger need for the rebalancing fu mark function in some markets at certain times than there is in others. Some people call it volatility. You can call it, you know, different things. Yeah. Those are those are the the ingredients yeah, that I think sense. that you need for yeah. long-term success. Now let's talk a little bit about financial regulation. Yeah, so uh, we've seen the banks uh, have basically almost all of them, not all of them, but almost all of them are, are out of the, went out of the business because of financial regulation. And, and to a certain extent, of course, that has benefited the, the different tra other trading houses and activities. Um, let's, let's, and, and I, you are doing recently, you took over, uh, Daniel, you took over the JP Morgan's uh, business, the, the, the energy business because of that. So JP Morgan was, uh, like like other banks also ha had to sell that business. Where do you think that's going? Is this the end of it? Will we see more regulation? Will the regulation also impact the trading companies? Is this beginning beginning of more or are we in some sort of stable state? Yeah, I, I, I think the, you know, the trading companies essentially perform a different function than, you know, what, what the, uh, what the than what the banks perform this function. And, and therefore, you know, all of us, we're, we're all trading companies, so we don't take, you know, people's deposits. We don't, you know, the, the function that we have is, is, is significantly different. And there is a trend for, globally, there's a trend for more regulation, which is something that, you know, probably you cannot get away from and in a way it's you know we embrace it as a as a company so we have we have a, a regulated entity 
one regulated entity here in the um, in the UK, which is FCA regulated, and then we have you know other entities that are in in that sense unregulated, but they do not. That does not mean that they don't act in markets that themselves have regulation. And I mean, if you start doing the numbers and counting, I asked my head of compliance before coming here, how many, you know, um, various regulators around the world we, you know, report different types of activity to. And we stopped at 100 because it got boring, right? There's just, just too many of them. So, so there is a, so the short answer is it's a different function. We perform, you know, a, a separate function. I think the regulator understands that. The regulators in general understand that. And um, the most important thing about regulation in general as a user of different markets, because really what we are, what all of us do here in one way or another, we use um, the different financial markets in order to hedge and lay off true commodity exposures that are created through our activity. So it's in all of the market participants' interest to essentially have markets that function properly so that, they're, that the tools can be used in such a way to you know, be able to hedge off true yeah. exposures. So I don't think you would get any you know, kind of quibbles from any of my, my co-panelists on that subject. That's why we started with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we started with you. Yeah. Ian, do you want to? Yeah, I, mean, I just want to maybe just, put, I mean, I agree with all Danny said, but just a little bit and slight, uh, I think we should stress to everybody, obviously while the, the trading departments of various banks are no longer major participants in, in the market, there are quite a few people who've taken their place to a certain extent. I and mean, there's still a very heavy element of financial um, companies in the, the futures markets. I mean, you know, you have hedge funds of, of different types, you have ETFs of different types, you have CTAs, you have, uh, you know, one or two people who are, uh, are purely spec trading, in the, in, in, particularly down the curve. To a certain extent, you know, they've replaced some of the activity that we saw from some of the, you know, the big Wall Street banks. To a certain extent, they haven't because they're, you know, they're doing it purely on either computer-generated models or, or, or different things. So, and we do have, and if you look at the volumes on most of these exchanges, they're still, they're not going down dramatically. Um, you know, to a certain extent, I think all of us, and uh, Daniel's absolutely right, you know, we're, we are physical arbitrage and so forth. We like to have availability of liquidity in the exchanges that we can use to hedge. Yeah. And to be honest, that is perhaps one of the slight losses, as far as I'm concerned, of losing, because the Wall Street guys were rather good at providing that, and, and some of the new financial uh, traders, to a certain extent, don't provide it because they're not interested in that. And they're not interested in it if you want a customer service of any kind. They, yeah. they are the, I mean, in some ways, and I think it's an important point to stress, and Torby mentioned it, they are the genuine speculative part of the market, um, you know, uh, which is, not ourselves, you know. Yeah. So, but they are there. So, I mean, there is a big, big, big financial element to, yeah. to futures markets. Anything to add, Torbino? Well, I mean, I, I, I agree. I think it's, it's also it's important to understand the trading house. We, we, do not, uh, we do not pose a systemic risk. You saw the meltdown 2008, mm. 2009. Nothing happened. And uh, there are... We are not against regulation. What we are against is bad regulation, which by the end of the day will be detrimental to what you want to achieve. If you regulate uh, uh, these markets or make them less accessible, you actually decrease competition and, and, and make the, the markets much more vulnerable for, for, uh, for fluctuations. We, we are regulated. What we do on these exchanges are scrutinized. If you have a too high position, somebody will call up and you have to explain. So it's not like we are not regulated. We are regulated by laws in every country we are operating, uh, every exchange we are operating on, the capital that we have to provide to securitize the, 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 the positions we have. So we are regulated. So this is a little bit of a misconception. And actually, if you ask many politicians, 
that they, they, they just think that we are, we are, excuse the word, screwing around in the market, which is yeah. wrong. And, and, and that's sad. I'm confident that, and I think we see the tendency that everyone sees this for what it is. And, 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 and that we, by the end of the day, are behaving uh, correctly. OK, maybe uh, another, another topic uh, moving away from, from, from uh, regulation. And it's, it's what we've seen the last years is that major oil companies, some of them are, are splitting up the, the upstream from the downstream. Does that make sense? Do you think that will continue? How do you see that? Will that open up uh, opportunities? We've seen Vitol buying uh, the, the downstream business of Shell in, in Australia. Is that a trend? Does that make sense? What, what do you think? And some companies, I think it's interesting also, we've seen a number of companies which when they split, they actually, the sum of the parts was higher on the, on the, the, the combination I mean, of the shares. Yeah. So clearly investors in most cases liked it. It looks like it, but... Well, it's only... It's only it's only happened three or four times, I think, in the United yeah. States, really, in fairness. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I sense the oil majors, in, in general, are beginning to see the benefit of the integrated model. I, I think they've obviously done a huge amount of work, to their credit, on, on things like cost. And I strongly feel, perhaps unfortunately, that, that, that we're not going to get any more major split-offs at this moment in time. I, 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 obviously, there are some issues about you know, sustaining dividends, et cetera, which obviously they can comment on much better than I can. But I, but I sense that, you know, particularly having done so much work to get upstream costs down, and, you know, I know it's discussed a bit this morning, that we won't see any major split-offs. Um, and I think, it, it, you know, we've seen the benefit in the last two or three years, perhaps, of having an integrated yeah. model right. with the, the, the tremendous results that uh, downstream has produced. So, personally, I, I don't think so. Any, Torben, any, any comments? Well, I, I actually tend to agree, but also having said so, I think all major companies, things are changing, the position in various markets are, are changing, and I think that uh, if you look, for instance, in the refining sector, I think there's a tendency from, uh, from major company to focus the refining sector on fewer, but much more bigger and complex and more efficient things. So they can't be everywhere. It is actually a matter of resources. So. I think they're streamlining. I don't think at all that they're going to uh, abandon the, uh, the integrated model because it does work. And actually, if you have, look here, when, the, when, when major oil companies lost a lot of money upstream, they made quite a lot of money in, uh, in uh, refining and metal. So I think that's also a wake-up call. These things go a little bit uh, yeah. in fashionable way, so to speak. So, so, so and, and, and for us, obviously, we have been lucky to be able to, when they spin off, we can be there. But uh, I tend to agree. I think it, uh, most of that work is done now. Yeah. Any comment? Daniel? Not really. I mean, yeah. no, no, we're, we're, you know, both, uh, both, both these guys here are, you know, significant, you know, have a significant presence in some of those fields. We've tended to, we've tended to, limit ourselves to to the midstream we think that you know the midstream um, presents opportunity you know be it you know storage be it you know pipes be it things that somehow fit into into our our willingness to actually touch the commodity um, along various steps of its of its journey touch that molecule and so far we've limited ourselves to that what the what the I think what what the the wider actors are doing is that there are phases of consolidation and then there are phases of splitting it up and I I th I'd say that the private equity people you know play a major role in that because they tend to go off and warehouse those certain types of assets when you know when a board decides that you know it's no longer suitable for the company. Um, <laughs> And, and then in the end, somehow those assets tend to find their way back to uh, someone else. I mean, that's the history. Basically, of... it's all Marcel's fault. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I blame it all on Marcel. So, so maybe, maybe, and it was was idea of, uh, of Daniel to also touch upon this subject, and it's the energy transition. So how do trading companies cope with energy transition? Is it a trading opportunity? Is it a threat? Daniel, it was your idea to 
talk about. Yeah, yeah. So see, this so. is what this is when I get punished. Well, I, it's 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 a great illustration of of sort of the the how quickly and how profoundly markets can change, and how how you know al capital needs to be allocated in 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 different ways, and when. There is a political will, for instance, to allocate capital in a new and different way. Think about the renewable space. It really started with a political will. What it did is it created a number of dislocations and it created a number of you know, complex problems that somehow the market needs to solve. And um, that's where traders through the, the, their ability to be nimble, allocate capital, and, and essentially um, you know, perform this rebalancing function. That's where traders can have a role. So I'll give you an example. I mean, when you think about, when you think about the, the, the green energy space, I mean, right now we're, we're, we're living through a total upheaval of how, um, uh, you know, how Europe is is essentially structuring and distributing, you know, its uh, its power and how you know the, the the input matrix works, and you know these are extremely complex problems where any contribution to to this rebalancing function is welcomed by the markets. Um, and another example, we were talking about it earlier. This is also I. I think for oil traders, they think, and I'd be here, interested to hear my, um, my colleagues' view on this, oil traders look at 75% um, of liquids demand in, in, in the oil space is somehow linked to transportation fuel. And you know, oil traders look at the future of electric in the transportation space and ask themselves questions about what it might mean for transportation fuels, et cetera, et cetera. It comes with complex problems. There, it's going to be a transition that possibly will take 15, 20 years, but um, capital is going to have to get allocated to the appropriate sources. And what it will do is, you know, we, we were joking before, one day, and I think most people agree that electric in transportation will become really relevant once you've solved storage issues and, 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 and you know, battery issues. But the day you've solved storage and battery issues, you're still somehow going to have to generate the basic power with which to, to, um, to, to power these vehicles. So you're going to move the, um, you're going to somehow move the needle, and as that needle moves, capital is going to have to get allocated to all of these different areas and, and that will create its own distortions which again will somehow have to be evened out over time. And so the rebalancing function in one way or another is always going to be there. Yeah. Ian. Electric cars. Yeah, I mean, you know, you have to be careful, everybody. This could be the end of the international, you know, oil and money conference. It won't exist anymore. It'll have to be the international renewables conference. But, I mean, obviously, for all of us, it, it's slightly difficult because, on the one hand, I agree with Daniel that obviously it's, it's a, a, there is a capital issue. But on the other hand, for us, we, 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 we are, as Torbjorn said earlier on, we're really logistics transportation companies, and most of these things do not actually move. Um, so it's a capital investment. In fact, ironically, I was talking this morning with my team about whether we should be offering solar panels in all our uh, gasoline stations in Africa, which we probably will do. But, you know, yes, there's change coming. Yes, we have to adapt. Yes, of course, we're going to try and adapt. But, but I, yeah, listen, it's, I, I find it very challenging because uh, there's a lot of things here which won't move in the way that we think about what we do every day in our business. And, and you know, are we able to, we, we don't have the skill set today, we have to change that, and, but you know, are we able to adjust? Well, we'll have a damn good try, but I'm, uh, I've got a horrible feeling that Amazon's gonna be a lot better at it than we are. <laughs> we have to learn, Torbjörn. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, 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 personally I think that, that, that um, uh, electric car is, is, is something which clearly will grow, but not 
in all parts of the world. Um, it takes time. It's expensive. And by the end of the day, uh, I do believe that uh, future transportation, by, by and large, will be based on the lowest cost of energy. And I'm not sure that we are talking about it if you take what it costs to make an a, a, uh, electric car. And no one has managed to make, uh, produce an electric car profitable yet, in spite of subsidies. What I think is in the transportation sector is that there are things happening. I think, for instance, the, 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 the gas, we haven't talked about gas and oil. There's an abundance of gas, and gas is cheap, it's clean, and it's will eat in to traditional uh, oil demand. In the petrochemical sector, power generation, it will take more and more share of, and, and uh, also in transportation, directly or indirectly. So I think here we will see, and we're actually living in a world, for the first time, in the first time in the modern energy society where you actually have competing energy sources. The power generation is one, coal, oil, gas. They're actually competing today head and head on a cost basis. And, uh, and uh, this will create, and obviously as a trading company, we're watching this and we'll see, and we talked about gas and LNG, and I think that, uh, that uh, you, Daniel, your company is very, very big in North America in, in, in gas pipe gas, which shows that the trading company can be very successful there, and I think we all are building LNG yeah. presence in a market which become more and more like oil. And uh, so, yes, it's inside that. Electric cars, I have my doubt on a large scale. I think oil will still grow, oil and gas will still grow in, in, uh, in absolute terms going forward. Well, that's good for the oil and money conference. So <laughs> Uh, so we have a last topic before we, we open it up to the floor. And again, it's a combined topic. It's a logical combination, I think. It's about OPEC and oil prices. But of course, from this panel, we would like to know what they think uh, is going to happen in the, in the, in the, on the short term, in the next six to 12 months with OPEC. And what they think, and I, I asked them before, we really would like to get a price out of you. Because if you don't give us a prize, no one will give us a prize. So, oh, and, so oh, and, and just, Ian, let me start with you. Oh, of course. Is, is Mohammed here? Where is, is, is the secretary, open secretary general in the room? Where is, where is he? He left already. Yeah. God. Um, is that, does that mean something? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> listen, this is absolutely hopeless because traders do get it always wrong. I mean, listen, three things very quickly. One, um, I think we all do believe that probably current rates of production are slightly in excess of demand and therefore longer term, you know, production has to come down a little bit if we really want to balance uh, demand in the short term. Obviously, we'll still expect to see some demand growth next year, but all the demand estimates keep coming in a little bit lower and all the supply keeps coming in a little bit higher. So obviously, November is quite an important month. Um, there's obviously a definite willingness and a desire on behalf of most of the OPEC countries to uh, to, uh, to see the price a little bit higher, but to do that, they will have to genuinely cut back. Um, you know, they've done it before, they can do it again. Um, you know, I'm not quite sure who's gonna do what, um, but I never, never ever want to rule them out. Um, you know, my expectation is that, that, we'll, that we'll get something. Um, whether it's quite good enough to really cause a substantial rebalancing in the short term, I'm not sure, but you know, you know, it's very, very boring, uh, Marcel. In, in some ways, and as I said, none of us really um, probably are, are going to speculate on it. You know, I mean, I. I you have I, to give us a number. Oh, when's the number four? <laughs> Can so, we have everybody else's small so let's bet? Say and then, next you know, year, next year, this conference. Next year, this conference. What, what do we get if we get it right? I mean, is it going to be a prize? Buy a great bottle of wine. A great <laughs> bottle of wine. Jesus <laughs> Christ! Is that good enough? You can't resist that. All right, so I'll go for fifty-four. 99. Brent or WTI? Brent, Brent. Brent. Here Brent. we go, here okay. we go. Brent, here we Front go. month Brent. <laughs> Front month Brent. Okay. I'm going to write it down because okay. I want to make sure he pays. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, Torbjörn. Well, compliment to your risk management on that question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I think that as, as, as uh, most of us was listening here to, uh, this morning session, I think the, 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 the theme was cost of production is coming down. And I think it has come down 
much, much more than people thought it would possible sitting here one year ago. Yeah. I mean, we hear some, I personally heard some surprisingly low number from some of the authorities that we listen to today. That probably keeps a cap on how much the market can go up. And, uh, and uh, Ian's analysis is absolutely correct. I think the futures market is very quick to do that, has already priced in some kind of agreement between these, uh, uh, the various parties. What kind of agreement that is? You have a suspicion that always paying, playing for time. So you can say, we're going to agree in three months' time. So they buy themselves three months' time. And because any effect, any, any cut will only take effect the next year anyway. But I think they have done enough to stem the rot, uh, personally I think so, to bring it substantially higher in the short term through next year. Anything can happen, the unexpected, I doubt it. I think we are here and a little bit higher. Yeah, so you you gotta give us a number, yeah, come on. Want number. <laughs> we want a number. 5498. <laughs> <laughs> That's cheating. <laughs> okay, You've Daniel. played this game before. <laughs> I know what he's going to say now. <laughs> and everybody in the room knows what you're going to say. Okay, I'll write it down before you say it. I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to go high. And the I've written down what he's already <laughs> going to say, just in case you know. And, and the reason why I'm going to go high is because for the first time in a while, I have the impression that I, I see political will um, where, where I didn't see it before. So I'm going to go high. And again, don't forget, I don't try to predict the absolute movement of price almost ever. And I, you know, I, I, I never do it to my traders. I don't do it to my colleagues. So the fact that I'm doing it in, you know, in front of a room full of you know, people and on the record is, uh, is, is, <laughs> is despite my better judgment. And I'm going to go agree with that. $58. Oh, wow. Oh, <laughs> you didn't need to do that to get the bottle of wine. <laughs> It's, no. It sounds like you know, it's, it's, it's very, 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 very close. Well, thank you. Let's open the, the floor for questions. Thank you. Ladies for first. Yeah, thank you. And in CEG Finance and Energy Arbitration. So, um, to give some, everyone a break from speculating about the future of the oil price and uh, go into discussion about the trading strategy, I would like to ask a personal question. So I've been to Total Energy Summer School and then I visited the Youth Day at International Gas Forum in St. Petersburg. And it feels like everyone really wants to engage young people into the energy sector. But at the same time, today, Mr. Dudley mentioned already that there is less and less young people who want to work for the oil companies. And at the same time, I know that Gunver is not hiring, many other companies are not hiring. So to capitalize on my status today as the leader for tomorrow's scholar, I would like to ask which skills and uh, business vision or maybe a strategy do you need to have to become an energy company CEO? Thank you. My God. <laughs> Torbjörn, you want to? A very good question. Yeah, I was like <laughs> to tell you. My compliments to that one. And, uh, um, what skill sets do you need to be a trader? Energy uh, and CEO, a that's camp. a really difficult question. Huh? She asked an energy CEO. Oh, an energy CEO. Um, <laughs> I think that, that obviously, like any, any, anyone who wants to seek a career, I think obviously you have a good background, you have a good, good education. And, 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 and as what we'd like to do is obviously we try to look for talents and, and, and try to give them uh, uh, training. On the other hand, if we want to build, we also have to buy in expertise. So I think it's a blend. I think we have examples of people who come directly from school to our um, company 
and they have been tried and uh, they have been uh, in, in various parts of the company and have made a career. Uh, so I don't think it's uh, that different. Uh, uh, that we, don't, we do hire. We haven't stopped hiring, so, so we are hiring for sure. Uh, we are expanding our businesses in the various parts of the world. It's an exciting environment. It's very global. Uh, tell you a story. I heard one old trader many years ago. He was complaining and complaining about the market. He was complaining about this, 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 this. Which and company? Said, Which company? It <laughs> doesn't matter. Many years ago, this trader. And I said, I asked him, so why don't you quit? And he said, why? Why would I quit? This is the best thing I'm doing. <laughs> so, it is an exciting market. It has uh, a lot of things to offer. So I recommend knock on the doors and I'm sure you get that. I just want to, to go a little bit further than you did, Marcel. I don't know most traders really like to talk very short term. Uh, but there is so much volatility in geopolitics, which we will discuss tomorrow, uh, the world is changing more rapidly than, than I think since, 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 since uh, when we were children. Uh, we see volatility in markets, we see uh, you know, everything is, is turning upside down. But what is so interesting, when we look at these projections, not done now for 40 years, it's always when prices reach $100, which it did a few years ago, it was always going to be around $100 or slightly higher, slightly lower. Now we see lower for longer and we find all kinds of reasons why we think it's going to be lower for longer but given the volatilities in the market and the uncertainties isn't it distinctly possible that by the time we are let's say five years later which is actually the next uh, investment cycle we could get an entirely different world and a world in which you're back maybe to to two hundred dollar oil which now seems unrealistic but it's a world of shocks rather than a world of, of stability. Because the only time I remember when we had real stability was in the 15 years following the collapse of the oil price in 1986. After that, volatility for most of the time. So who wants to, Ian, you want to? I mean, I'm obviously Herman, you're, you're right about geopolitics. This is probably a pretty difficult uh, global outlook today. I mean, obviously, I think, I think in terms of absolute volatility, I think I'm correct in saying that this year's not been that big a move on the oil price, relatively speaking, compared to some of the years gone by. Um, you know, we had a little bit more intraday, and I would almost argue that's where financial players could have a bigger role on the intraday rather than over time. I mean, of course you're right. I mean, you know, but the trouble is we do genuinely run risk businesses, and we do, even if we're looking upstream or downstream, doesn't matter, we're going to take the... I think our companies will take the future screens, whatever it tells us today, and hedge it and deal with it. Do I totally rule out the fact we could be sadly at 100? I hope we're not for the sake of the world, but, but I can see a couple of scenarios, we don't want to talk about them probably, where that would make it happen, yes. So I, I'm not, having been there before, um, you know, I also was stupid enough to sell oil at $5 a barrel. I mean, you know, you know so I, I just don't, I mean, rightly or wrongly, I just think it's probably something that, sadly, you know, because of the, and thankfully, the use of the future screens, none of us, maybe incorrectly, really consider, you know, that actually happening because we know we're going to be up or down, protected largely. So, bad okay. answer, but, but sadly, not, not something we, we have to worry about. I, um, I, may, I may just interject one thing there. I, a market where the marginal excess or deficit tends to price the whole complex, by definition, is going to show volatility on a future outlook, right? Um, the good news is the investor doesn't necessarily have to take a view on that because as long as there is a way of laying off that risk, if you like, it, it, you know, that's not really a problem. Um, so that's as far as volatility is concerned. Then there's an issue of liquidity, i.e. if a market is unable to warehouse the risk that needs to be laid off, that's almost a bigger risk than the volatility itself. It's the liquidity risk. Um, so I, I would make a, a, a distinction 
um, between yeah. those two things. And then the third thing is that there is an increasing correlation of financial assets. So oil has, or energy in general, has a functionality. It serves a purpose. But over time, it's also become an investment vehicle. And what tends to happen is the financial price of oil has generally been decorrelated from some of the other asset classes. And what we're seeing over the last few years is a general macro correlation that is increasing between those, between those different asset classes, which causes its own problems. Okay, thank you. The last question. Hi there, um, I'm James Cocaine from Mies, Middle East Economic Survey. Um, I think uh, Mr. Taylor was saying that there's uh, not too many uh, niches for trading firms to make, uh, make money nowadays, but one area that we've noticed trading firms taking a bigger role is with uh, countries that have, if you like, squeeze liquidity or cash flow problems and need uh, unusual credit terms, if you like. I'm thinking of uh, Kurdish oil exports, where most has been sold to trading companies on prepayment deals, and also um, Egypt for their... Keep it, keep it a little bit short, because we're over time. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just asking, do you see this as a particular niche for trading firms, countries where they need uh, yeah. sort of credit combined with uh, trading? Listen, it's, it's a fair question. Um, I would say, on balance, Probably yes. Do we take a little bit more credit risk, maybe, than certain other uh, other like NOCs or ISCs? Yes. Are we right or wrong? I'm not sure. Come back. Let's discuss it in a few years' time. I mean, totally, a lot of these things are very long term. And uh, but yeah, I mean, there's there's, no, there's more risk to it. There is more risk to these trades. But when you know, they're not. Uh, the market is very well priced, and there are huge risks to these trades. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you.